Strangely enough, this is the first thing, and because we're going to talk about please, please, please don't use your mobile devices. I'll explain it to you later. It's one of the seven dots. Okay? But I prefer people not having their mobile devices open and active. I'm going to be discussing six or seven things that you shouldn't do and why and that you actually should do. Okay? And the first is based upon the idea that people and kids can multitask. And uh, there's something uh, I'll have to come across. But wait a second, I'm working on I'm, 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 I'm happy at the moment. Um, First, it's important to know what a multi what multitasking is, because most people don't know what it is. Multitasking <coughs> means that you're busy carrying out two information processing activities or more at the same time. So it's not walking and talking. It's not walking and chewing gum. Anything that you've automated, you don't think about. So it's not cognitive process. So the first thing you have to realize when I say this is that people can't multitask. And what I'm saying is they can't carry out two information processing activities at the same time. You can carry out 12 things at the same time if you don't have to think about them. Yeah? And the idea of multitasking, and you see it here, is that people can do it and that there's no loss of speed, no loss of accuracy. And that's the case if you're a computer and you have more than one central processing unit, multi-core computers. Because each of those central processing units, if it's a four-core, can carry out completely independently of the other three an information processing activity. But we have a problem in Houston, and that's we have one central processing unit. And that's called our brain. And we can't do that. And it's, uh, it's, its origin is uh, in the computers. What we can do is task switch. We can switch from one task to the other. But what does that mean? If we task switch, we begin on something, and we have a cognitive schema. I, I mean, I'm assuming I don't have to under describe things like what's a cognitive schema and things like that. If there's something unclear, ask me and I'll try to uh, uh, discuss it. You have a cognitive scheme in your head while you're carrying it out. That could be solving a biology problem. And all of a sudden, you start on a second task. An email comes in. And you have to switch from the schema that you're working with at that moment to a completely different schema. That could be your work home situation, because the email is about what time will be home tonight, dear darling. Or it could be um, uh, related to a, a report that you wrote, or whatever. But you have to switch from one scheme to the other, and get into that. And you carry that out, and when you do that, you have what's called a switching penalty. Yeah? You lose time, and you lose focus. Now you carry out the second one, and it's done, and you go back, and you go back to your original one, or sometimes you even start on the third one. And you again pay a switching penalty because you have to switch from one scheme to the other. Huh? You also see that the mistakes that people made, make in that is that you're working on something, you get an email. And the email is from someone in the department, and they're telling you it goes to the whole department, and it's telling you about a new rule that the boss has thought about. Because it's his or her job to spread the bad news. Yeah? And you want to sell, send an email back to that one person from, oh man, she's stupid. What you do is you send it to the fly off. <laughs> Why? Because you're busy with something else. You are busy, you're making a mistake. Yeah? So it leads to slower processing and more mistakes. And what does it lead to? It leads to longer study times. Um, there was a, a great study in which they let people read a small piece of text, 
It took five minutes to learn to last it if you were only reading the text. Then they gave that same text to the same people. They also switched back and forth, so it was kind of balanced. And they were interrupted every once in a while, about every three seconds, with a short message, an SMS. And what they found was that the people who were interrupted, who had to multitask, it took them eight and a half to nine minutes to learn it to the same level as if you were doing it without being interrupted. Okay? So it means that the interruptions, that task switching, that doesn't mean you can't learn it to master it, but what it does mean is that it takes more time. So it's not more efficient in any, in, in, in any of that. But yeah, it's also not more effective because it leads to lower grades. How do we know that? Because I did research on it. It's that simple. And you see that people who multitask quite a bit have on a scale of 1 to 10, which is the Dutch way of doing it, 1 to 1.5 one points less on their grade point average. Which isn't bad if you normally get a 9 out of 10, but if you get a 6, 6.5 out of 10, that could be a problem. And why? Because when we also discussed it with them, they didn't study longer. They studied just as long as the people who didn't multitask. In other words, going back to the first one, they could have learned it to master it if they had spent <laughs> four hours studying, but they only spent two hours studying for the examinations while they were being interrupted while doing it. You tend to miss important things. There's a great study of people um, driving in a car, and now I'll grab my champagne for that because this is actually the moment. And then, um, yeah, I'll tell you why. Uh, this by Strayer and his colleagues, they did a study. And in that study, they had people driving in a high uh, fidelity, fidelity is the word, high fidelity uh, simulator, car simulator. And they had one group of people who were just driving. One group who were driving, legally driving, close. And one group who were driving, while on their cell phone, hands free. And what did they find? First they found that the people who were driving and driving and drinking had zero accidents. The people who were talking on the telephone had accidents. And I'm not talking about significantly more or less. No accidents versus accidents. Okay? Second, that the amount of time it took to break was longer. Not only was the amount of time to break longer, the amount of time to resume their speed was longer. So if you're caught while driving drunk, the best thing you can say to the cop is, well, at least I wasn't talking on my telephone. <laughs> I don't think it'll work, but you can try it. But no, e even more important thing is, and because people think, you know, driving hands-free or, or whatever, I, I don't drive hands-free, so that should be okay. It's not about your hands. Because that way you couldn't scratch your nose, drink a cup of coffee, smoke a cigarette, don't, or whatever. It's about where your head is. And how do we know that? Because then they ask these people, again, what color was the jacket of that little girl who came out between the two cars, and the drug people, and the people who were just driving said, wait, and the people who were talking on the telephone said, what girl? In other words, where your mind is, is what's important, and not where your hands are. There's a loss of concentration. Um, uh, Ophir and Nass did a great study, and they showed that people who multitask more are less capable of neglecting. Um, what? Neglecting, thank you. Um, neglecting irrelevant stimuli. So that means they were just put on a, a screen and they were like red, uh, blue uh, um, rectangles. And they were supposed to just concentrate on the red rectangles. 
And every once in a while, a blue rectangle would enter. And the people who were experienced multitaskers could not not look at the irrelevant rectangles that were being added. So apparently it also leads to a loss in the ability, executive functions, to neglect certain things. And finally, it leads to what's called classic addiction phenomena, in which we have a new uh, psychosis. It's called uh, um, non-existent iPhone itch. <laughs> where people feel their um, telephones ringing while they're not ringing, if they're off. Okay? So don't. <coughs> don't allow switching. And don't encourage switching. And do encourage your students to, mo to monotize. <coughs> and Allow kids themselves, I can send you a, 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 a game that you can play with the kids that will prove to them that if they're monotasking, that they're sneller and more accurate than if they're multitasking. It's something you can carry out with your students within three minutes and will prove to them that monotasking works better than multitasking. Second, and that's, that's one of the reasons I didn't want you to have your mobile devices. Okay, because I want you to listen to me. And not look at your email or send WhatsApps or Facebook, things like that. But the second is that when you're taking notes with a laptop or a, um, a, a mobile device, it's uh, your ears in and your fingers out. Why is that? The reason for that is if you take notes with pen and paper, unless you've taken steno as scoopers, <laughs> you probably cannot take notes as quickly as I can speak. So what do you have to do? You have to paraphrase it. You have to choose the important words and the less important words. Um, you have to uh, summarize things that I've said. Because you're physically not capable of writing as fast as I can talk. But most of your students, most of the children, and I'm talking about people up to the age of 30, 35 at the moment, <coughs> the digital natives, um, they're capable of typing as quickly as I can speak. So it goes into their ears, they type it out, it comes on the paper, but they haven't thought about it. But learning is thinking. Learning is processing information. So if you don't process information, you don't learn anything. And how do we know that? Well, we tested the students afterwards, and the students that wrote it down with pen and paper scored immediately better than those who were taking notes with the laptops. Okay, but yeah, the test is usually the next week or two weeks later. So we'll let them check their notes. And of course, the kids who took the notes on the laptop they have exactly what you said. They also <laughs> score lower than people who look at their own notes to paper. Why? Number one, the students who are done with the laptop. We're now processing it for the first time. Without the benefit of my being there, my gestures, my slides, or whatever. Yeah. <coughs> the students who looked at their own notes had to reprocess it, so they were processing it now for the second time. And we know that the more you process it, the more often you process it, the stronger the memory trace is. So the better you learn it. <coughs> but they also learn more deeply, because they only had the notes. So they think of, what did he actually say? I paraphrased it, but what did he actually say? What was that example that he gave? Those types of things. So they were processing it more deeply. Yeah? So, don't, don't allow note-taking on a laptop. Do teach kids how to take notes. Most kids haven't been taught how to take good notes. Most kids haven't learned to summarize. Most kids haven't learned to outline. And most haven't learned to study. 
we take it for granted that they're probably capable of doing that. Take it from me and not from granted. We did a study on making use of summaries as a, a, a tool for retrieval practice. And we thought, oh, retrieval practice, that's when you bring it back out of your memory and you know, like giving yourself a quiz. And what's the best quiz you can give a kid? Have them summarize it. And it didn't work. And I said, hey, let's look at the summaries. Pardon my language, but the summaries are shit. <laughs> So if you can't summarize, you can't make use of summary as a retrieval practice approach. So if you want to do this, you also have to make sure that your kids, your students, your pupils are capable of doing it. Yeah? Uh, the, 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 the summary of the practice. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll give you an answer immediately. I have no idea. I, um, uh, the, the, the reason is, um, I have absolutely no knowledge of children with learning with differences. Yeah? So anything I say is as worthless as if my grandmother had said it. Because I don't know any, I, I, I don't, I have problems with the expertise generalization syndrome. Um, I'm an expert in cognitive psychology and learning, and I know nothing about children with dyslexia or dyscalculia. So I'd love to give you an answer, but I can't. Okay? Um, it's also the second unit, second hand smoke. Here's a, 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 a nice graph. On the left is the effect of multitasking on comprehension. You think, for, you think, okay, for those kids who are using a computer and also every time, every once in a while, looking at the newspaper or sending apps or something is bad for them. And it is. Look at the left hand side. But what's now the problem? If I have my computer open, my laptop open on the desk, what well, I'm doing it, the person left and right in me will be constantly triggered by the flickering, the change of the screen, while he or she is not listening to the lecture. And 50% of the students say that they're actually distracted by the computer next to them. And you say, okay, maybe they're just being snowflake. Yeah? But what's the case? The effect of peer distraction, you see here that the proportion of correct, let's say, is almost a six, five and a half to six on the scale of ten. If you could view multitasking and you got a seven and a half to eight, if you had no view. So in other words, you're not only hindering yourself, and as a teacher allowing it, you're not only hindering the children who are reading, who are using the computer themselves, but you're also hindering the kids next to them. It's kind of like second-hand smoke. It's not only that you're giving yourself lung cancer, but you're also giving it to those around you because they can't escape it. There's one guy at Harvard who did a great thing. He said, okay, if you want to use it, I don't want anyone to use it, but if you want to use it, we're going to do it this way. Only this part of the group is allowed to use it and actually cordon them off and the rest there so that those people did not have any influence on the rest. So don't allow it, don't cave in to the kids or their parents, because that's the problem, and do create moments in the lesson, if the computer is necessary, that they can make use of it for a functional operational reason. Because of course, computers can be used in the classroom. You can be listening to something and they say, stop, now we're going to go to discuss um, uh, what the effects of this is, of what GMOs are. Go online and go to R and R and yeah, go here and there and do it. Great, do it. But have it open when it's necessary and closed when it's not. Because let's face it, none of us are capable of withstanding the draw of the flickering screen. It's just that simple. Reading is reading, right? It, 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 this is a, a, a liquid paper. You say, it, it, let them read from the screen or from an e-reader. The problem is that that's not the case. All research shows us 
that reading from a physical entity makes learning better than reading from a screen, independent of what screen. Now, a lot of reasons for that. Some is just the physical feel, some is just the topography, some is the fact, sometimes the fact that you can go from one place to the other, you have a kind of uh, memory. There are all different reasons for it, but all research lets us see that reading from the physical artifact makes learning better, facilitates learning. Are you here? And you see, there are slight differences in the screen. It's faster than for paper. Okay. Okay, if you don't say point. Yeah. They thought they understood. But it was better for paper. It made no, no difference if you if, if you're asking general questions like what was it about? But if you're asking specific questions about what it was, then paper was better. So Depending on what you want them to do, you can say, well, if you want them only to have the gist of the, you know, it really doesn't make a difference. But if you want them to do more than that, then it makes it, it makes it. And there is absolutely no difference between an e-reader, a tablet, or a computer screen. Yeah? Well, no, that's, that, that's, okay. Uh, do we have an hour or two? Um, in that case, we don't have to read much. But the problem is, and that's what I want, if someone has a whole shitload of money, I, mean, uh, um, I want to start a project which is called the Cognitive Theory of Multimedia Assessment. Because we have no idea what we're doing with multimedia assessment. That's the one. What we do is we make use of the Cognitive Theory of Multimedia Learning, from which Mayer, but learning Multimedia learning, the idea behind it is to make learning as efficient, effective, and easy as possible. Yeah? But the idea of assessment is not to make it as easy as possible, because you want people to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff. You actually want to add extraneous load and not remove extraneous load. So when we make, that's why I said about an hour and a half or two, when we make online assessments, the problem is we have no good theory guiding how we design and develop it. And some people make use of the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. We've done research to it, but all it does is it makes the tests worse. Because you're doing actually the opposite of what you want to do. And we did that for those in Dutch, the Cito tubes in it. We redesigned them. In, 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 in that way. So what I'm busy with is with some other people trying to get together enough money to do a, a study that will lead to, let's say, the analog of which layers cognitive theory of multimedia learning to a cognitive theory of multimedia assessment. Yeah? Um, if you want to learn from it, yes. yes. Well, then you want, yeah, but it usually leads is what I call the uh, ADHD, ADHD, uh, and that's a hyperlink, a hyperlink deficiency. <laughs> what it means is people flitter from one um, uh, to the other um, uh, hyperlink and lose sight of the whole text in itself. Yeah. 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 Right. That, 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 I mean, that, 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 could, that could work. Okay. I haven't done the study. That could work. But I would actually say uh, read it and have your thing over and go look in the dictionary. Yeah. Um, because leaving and coming back tends to lead to less structure. So don't assign reading online or use online textbooks and do print it and encourage one of my hobby horses, no cost of an education of itself. Look at the work by Dave Wiley uh, from Newman in, uh, in America and you'll see the 
example, the epitome of what we should be doing with open education resources. Uh, by the way, that's, I slept the night at this occasion this morning. This morning. Granddaughter Elsa. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, sorry. The, the multitasking person is my daughter Mara. Um, this idea that kids are digital natives. Now, first of all, digital natives is someone born after 1984. So we're talking about most of you. And if you're 35 or less or younger, you're a digital native. Or all of a sudden, 60 year olds, you're going to reach the stage of being baby boomers by digital natives. Okay? But according to um, people like uh, uh, Lynn Fain, uh, kids, by the fact of that they've never been exposed to anything except digital environments, are capable of doing all of this, and this is a direct quote of him, yeah? That they, are, that they learn is that independently, playfully, and without instruction, have developed metacognitive skills for doing all of these things. So I don't know if any of you are teachers, but if you are, you should be shaking your head and saying, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, pardon my French. Yeah? But this is what people believe. I call it, as I said, the attention that's in hyperlink together. Where they that's based upon the butterfly in the previous one has a reason. Uh, J.B. Solomon called this the butterfly defect. And he spoke of the fact that uh, learners flutter as a butterfly from one interesting piece of information to another. That eventually gain a little bit of interesting knowledge but have no idea of the structure of the whole. And he called it the butterfly defect, which can do become great in that. Um, so don't be fooled. Don't believe the edgy quacks and all these new age prophets. Yeah, I can't say it any other way. I'm outspoken, and I'm outspoken for a reason, because I think that the, 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 the Joe Bowlers and the Sir Ken's and the Subata Mitras and the idiot of uh, Maurice the Holt. <laughs> um, they're, 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 they're talking about things they have no idea about. So do assess what kids can do before beginning to use a technique. Yeah? Let them acquire the skills if you're required to use it. If you want them to collaborate to learn, you have to teach them how to collaborate to learn. Now, of course, playing games they've done since they were born, it's, 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 it's David Geary's uh, uh, primary uh, knowledge and skills. But collaborating to learn is something completely different. There's a cultural thing. It means you react to each other differently. You have to learn how to do it. Don't assume that they can. Knowledge is perishable as a fresh fish, fresh fish. By the way, for the Dutch here, there are Dutch people here. Yeah? <laughs> this was something that was uh, propagated by Wu in itself. He was a professor on seven or eight different universities at the same time. He is also Secretary of Education, and his perishability with respect to that was really shorter than thick. Within two days, he was fired. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> what people don't seem to understand is that there's a difference between knowledge and information. There's a, a hell of a lot of new information coming to us, and also a hell of a lot of sources of this. But that doesn't make what we know wrong. I mean, the Pythagorean theorem still works. And, and the, the, the Union of Utrecht, and all of these things, it's all still exactly the same. It doesn't change. And it's all necessary in, to be able to judge the newest information. And I'll just, I have to look at how much time I have. Uh, I saw a couple of minutes. Um, but look at what was said by the two very brilliant shining lights of the uh, Green Happiness. Oh, yeah. The Green Happiness said we shouldn't eat eggs. And why shouldn't we eat eggs? There are a couple of reasons. And one of them is because they're the menstruation of, kit, of, of, of chickens. <laughs> now you say, oh, these are dietitians. They're in the NRS, NRSA, so it must be true what they're saying, and things like that. But let's go back a step. 
chickens. Menstruation. Menstruation means that you have to the ovulation and the monthly ovulation. Oh, only mammals can do that. Is a chicken a mammal? No. So without this knowledge, you might accept it, but if you have a basic knowledge of biology, you should look at that and you should say, boom, throw it in. The knowledge that you have is so incredibly necessary to understand all of this new information and make use of it. And of course, we hear from people like Sugata Mitra, it's all on the web, so we don't have to learn. He went so far as to say you don't have to learn modern languages because you have uh, an iPhone that will translate it for you. I went a step further, I said, well, I have a computer that's capable of writing things that I say, so I don't have to learn to write. And since I have a computer that can press on a certain thing and it will read the page for me, I also don't have to learn how to read. But he doesn't seem to understand that that's the logical extension of what he's saying, but he's a solid state physicist in a TV spot about education, but everybody follows it, but be hard beside it. Uh, it's all the way how you choose. It, 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 it's not about looking for, it's about finding and making, uh, interpreting and making good use of what you find on the web. I'll give you an example, and it's not a made-up example. There was someone who was asked to write an article about this map, a journalist. Sir Francis Bacon, 16th century national, uh, natural philosopher. For those of you who don't understand that, that means physicist. Okay? And the person did a Google search and wrote a great article on this person. <laughs> Sir Francis Bacon. Because they Googled. And of course, what did they find? Not a 5th, 16th century natural philosopher. They found Sir Francis Bacon, the modern artist. Without knowledge of what you look, what, what, what it is, you can't make use of the information. And I'm sure that the information over this Sir Francis Bacon was true, possibly true about him, about his artwork, and uh, about how much money his painting sold for, and things like that. But without knowledge of what a 9th, 16th century natural philosopher is and what the scientific method is, you can't do your work. So, don't assume the kids can do this because they can't. You have to teach them. Teach them how to use it. Teach them how to evaluate sources, how you can find is this a reliable source or a not reliable source. If I'm talking about nutrition, should I look at um, the Food and Food and Drug uh, Association, or IVM in the Netherlands, or should I go to Coca-Cola and McDonald's? Dick Clark, good colleague of mine, good friend of mine, wrote this in 1983, and it's still true. It was an article in the review of education research in 1983. And it's still true. And what he did is, with uh, Dave Feldman, he, he took dubious reasons to using multimedia learning, and he put out all of the reasons and showed why it's great. 2006 book in the handbook of multimedia learning. He says, you can do all of this. But the recent first uh, uh, five, this was the second five, and that Using ICT is a tool, and if you use it properly, it can work, and it can be good. But it means you have to know how to use it, and how not to use it, and you have to know the pitfalls. And hopefully, the six or seven pitfalls that I discussed today will help you look at media a little bit better when you decide whether to use it. If you want to read more, and it's because this is an English session, uh, I often publish uh, uh, online in three star learning experiences. The reason it's called three star learning experiences is because of cook. Three stars, Michelin is best to do. And I say that every teacher, every learning designer, 
should have a deep conceptual knowledge and conceptual and skills in the tools, techniques, and ingredients of their education to make them effective, efficient, and enjoyable. And if you need to get in touch with me, this is the way you get in touch with me. Follow me on Twitter, and um, as people know I usually respond to emails and things very, very quickly, but I don't get into Twitter arguments with anybody. I like to be safe.